Do what? Okay. And I realized I left pen. For those of you online, we're going to wait a couple more minutes to start. We're running slow this morning. All right, we're going to go ahead and get started, and hopefully we'll uh, have people coming on and coming in as we go. <clears throat> Just a reminder, this is uh, the third part of a three-part sequence on faith, hope, and love. So we went to uh, 1 Corinthians 13. Um, you know, hit the last part of, uh, of that passage, <clears throat> and then we had um, uh, a month on, uh, on faith, and then um, a month on hope, and then we're doing August on love. We've got one more week, so um, we're going to hit another topic that I originally didn't think I was going to have time to, uh, to get much into today, and then, uh, <clears throat> and then we'll pull some things together uh, next week. We've, uh, we've tried to step back and, and take a look at um, uh, kind of the different words for love, uh, really talk about the context and the concept around um, agape as it's used in 1 Corinthians 13. We've gone all the way back to uh, the Sermon on the Mount and walked through kind of how that's woven all the way through Jesus' approach and his message on the Sermon on the Mount. Um, broken down... Um, the characteristics of love in 1 Corinthians 13. I talked a little bit about the fact that it's not a uh, sort of one and done, that somehow we become a Christian and all that's there, but talked about the build process um, and the work that's required to get there and then the attitude behind it. And if you remember, um, uh, I closed last week and kind of the last, uh, the last slide we hit was actually... Um, Kind of this is a, as something to think about and contemplate, which is the, the power of love through God has the power to transform lives. And, you know, really just uh, step back and think about that over the course of, uh, course of the week and given some of the things we've been through, talk about uh, um, kind of the, the work required and building to that sense of, uh, of agape. <clears throat> so what do I really mean by this question? Is God a necessary condition for love? And this is, and the reason for the quotes, of course, is going back to where we started. We've kind of had it in quotes all the way through, is that sense of agape love. So a little bit of difference between the t different types of love, four or seven, depending on which version you want to look at. Um, but this notion of uh, 1 Corinthians 13, as well as elsewhere, where there's this higher form of love, if you will, which is what God showed to us and what we are actually called and commanded to show to others. There's a lot of people, particularly today, that would question whether God is not only kind of a necessary condition, 
but potentially God is actually a barrier um, to showing true love. And we'll, we're going to get into that a little bit uh, as we go through this. Um, there is a, this is where you come back to the difference in kind of the different types of love as well. So brotherly love, phileo, um, versus agape, um, or some of the other um, uh, words for love. Agape is, is intended, and, you know, there's some people that will argue kind of that point as well. If you go to, uh, we talked a little bit about uh, when, when Jesus was dealing with Peter um, and his denial and how he went back and forth kind of using agape and uh, phileo um, as he was asking Peter, do you love me? One of the senses that, uh, that sometimes is brought out, and it's hard to say this is totally accurate, but that's one of the things you get when you start, you know, looking through this in more detail, is there are, there's a lot of inconsistencies or kind of blending back and forth in terms of this discussion. But one of the characterizations is that agape being completely um, a, a, a giving sense, a one way, is a one way sense of love versus phileo being more of a bi directional. It requires a response, it requires more um, of a kind of context or relationship than agape does. Um, and so one of the questions is well, well why does that matter and, and how does that make a difference? Um, <clears throat> our belief, and I think for most of us as Christians, uh, and particularly looking at uh, um, some history, is that God is a necessary condition for this kind of love. You have to be able to get outside of and beyond yourself. Um, and, and literally, this is where you'll get into some arguments, um, have a sense of something greater. Have a sense of God who basically was willing first to love us, was willing to make the sacrifice of sending Jesus after an entire history of working with his people over time um, and continuing to, uh, we talked about forbearance and forgiveness and continuing to kind of uh, be patient and persevere. Um, so we're gonna get into that a little bit uh, today in terms of why and, and kind of how this plays out. So again, this kind of notion of um, is, is the power of love actually there because of the nature of humanity or is it there because it comes through God? Uh, which is what I think we typically um, are, are going to want to you know, take as a position and believe and that most of us do. If we open our hearts to the love of God, which is kind of the first, the first step, God's continuing love for us, um, and then to the Spirit, which we've talked about several times as well, um, we are actually called to a response to that love. Um, we are commanded to love, but we're also, we're also called to respond in a number of ways. So these are three, three passages we've been through multiple times. 1 Corinthians 13, um, these three remain faith, hope, and love, but the greatest of these is love. Uh, and this is after having described um, what love looks like, um, the characteristics of love, what love is and is not. Um, and we broke, th broke that down and went through that in some detail. But again, this kind of, you know, if you look at the fruit of the Spirit, what is the first thing that's mentioned? Love. And then joy, peace, forbearance, kindness, goodness, all those are kind of, you could argue there are other characteristics. There may be components to love, but we're starting with, you know, that, uh, that, that sense of loving, being concerned about, caring for, responding to, and reflecting the love of God to others around us. We talked a little bit about um, we're called to love God first. We're called to love each other, meaning within kind of the, the Christian family, um, the children of God. And then we're called, that's for a, a, really a calling to a kind of a special type of consideration and love. And then we're called to love those around us. Um, but as opposed to being a generic call, it's very specific. It's about that individual that you're sitting next to, that you live next to, that you work next to, 
Um, so as opposed to a sense of more of a kind of generic, um, all of humanity, you can extend to that, but this is a call for love that says, love those who are around you, even love your enemies, right? Do good to them. Um, that's not a normal kind of human response that we would typically, typically see. Um, and then we talked quite a bit about first or second Peter and the whole kind of notion that this doesn't happen all at once, but in fact, um, it's an effort, it's work, right? You add faith to your faith, goodness, to goodness, knowledge, knowledge, self-control. And self-control is, again, something we've come back to multiple times in terms of the idea of discipline, self-control, um, building, and continuing to develop the, those characteristics. Um, perseverance, perseverance, godliness, godliness, brotherly kindness, and then love. So it's a, it's a journey, and I think most of us would recognize it's not a journey where you get there tomorrow or next week. It's literally a lifelong kind of effort to build that kind of love and to become more, more Christ-like and reflecting um, uh, the characteristics and the love of God. Okay, so here's a twist that um, <clears throat> I'm going to talk about a little bit. Some of you have heard me talk about this in a class before, um, and the reality is it's a long discussion, which we can't go into in a lot of detail today. Um, you will see this played out. I think we've seen it played out uh, a lot in different settings over the last couple of years in particular. But there is this debate about the highest form of love and um, some accompanying arguments, if you will, that... Um, um, that kind of come through around that. Most of us have heard the term humanism. We've talked about that kind of in class a little bit uh, in terms of the nature of humanism, what the context is, that it's not a general term. There is actually the Humanist Society of America and a bunch of others. And it has a very specific um, manifesto and charter. The first one came was written in the 1930s. Um, and actually was the beginnings of, and they were the major supporters of the eugenics movement. Um, and we don't have time to go into all the history of what that means and why, but it is kind of tied into the characteristics of um, humanism, the idea of sociobiology, which actually came out in the late 70s, early 80s, um, is kind of built around being objective, the concept of uh, things like love and altruism, uh, altruism was a big debate within that, are built on the basis of science, objectivity, relativity, and relatively, relatively, relativity is interesting because it's not quite the same as situational ethics, but it's this notion of science does have to self-correct itself as it goes, or our understanding has to self-correct, therefore we're constantly kind of moving our understanding of what is ethical behavior or what is moral behavior, but it is built on the sense that there is no absolute, um, but it all has to be done within the context of kind of rational perspective, rational sense of humanity, belief in humane um, as a core characteristic. Um, and then sociobiology brought in this added component of genetics, um, your gene as the controlling element. And so everything kind of comes back to um, us as a genetic animal um, that is, and we are fundamentally in our society, and this is where sociobiology started, we are actually very similar and don't have that big a difference between us and ants, which is where Edmund Wilson came up with the original kind of concept. He did an entire book and then went from the next to the last chapter in the book and the last chapter was, therefore, based on all this stuff that I've just said about ants and ant colonies, et cetera, et cetera humans follow exactly the same patterns um, and are driven by the same things, et cetera. And then there's a whole string of things that came after that. A uh, phrase that actually is a book title that's gotten used a lot is called the selfish gene. Now, the latest version of the manifesto was done in the 1990s, and it was actually done by a core group of people that were in the sociobiology community. Um, and it was avowedly 
The one in the 1930s, the one in the 70s was, but the one in the 90s was clearly um, anti-God, and I use that term in a more general sense here, uh, where the whole nation, notion of religion and a higher being is actually harmed humanity over time more than anything else. And so it is avowedly atheistic in its premise and its structure, you know, et cetera. And one of the interesting things about that is that there was a lot of debate on, but how do you explain altruism? And their definition and kind of the understanding of altruism is one of those things that had to go through some self-correcting perspective because originally the concept was that altruism was purely, you would do something altruistically primarily to protect your family and your direct gene pool. And that was the concept of why really there wasn't anything kind of this higher level of altruism, but it was all tied back to uh, protecting your genetic strain and your gene pool. Um, and they went back in really kind of the 2000s and softened that a little bit and tried to kind of make that a little bit broader and allow for a broader context around that. And in fact, kind of it's actually all of humanity um, that is being protected, which is a bit of a, a bit of a stretch. But the important thing coming out of that is that humanity in general, society specifically, and even science can all be improved if we eliminate God. So that's kind of the premise that we need to go back to a purely scientific, objective, rational approach. Um, and if we eliminate God, then our sense of love, which comes back to more of a phileo, a brotherly kind of love as the context. Um, God is actually more of a negative consideration within that framework um, than, a, than a positive. So rather than love kind of emanating from God, um, it comes from kind of the basis of being human um, and protecting humanity as your broader gene pool. Um, and so altruism and everything else kind of falls within that context. Um, the other reason that you'll see some arguments for why, let's say, phileo is more important than, than um, uh, agape love or this context of uh, altruism and just doing you know, good with no expectation of return um, is, is really the sense that, uh, that that direct connection to another person is kind of a critical part of this and, the, and it needs to be bi-directional. And so you ha actually have an expectation of some sense of return. Um, everything comes with a trade-off is kind of the notion. And so there really is no such thing as kind of love without something attached to it um, is kind of the idea. So when you look at the history of humanism um, and kind of this notion of self-correcting eth eth ethics, you have to be totally comfortable that there is no higher standard, that there are no absolutes, and that you actually trust um, humanity today and the history of humanity um, as the ultimate judge of what's right and good or um, a, in terms of managing a sense of justice. So it's, it's an interesting, uh, when you step back a little bit and say, you know, kind of what's going on around us uh, a lot these days and what do you see? The idea is that, you know, humanism, this is literally reading from some things off the American Humanist Association site. Humanism is a progressive philosophy of life that without theism or other, other supernatural beliefs affirms our ability and responsibility to lead ethical lives of personal fulfillment that aspire to the greater good. So they've kind of woven several things together in there. But essentially it takes responsibility and accountability back to us um, that A, we're gonna lead whatever we determine as a life of personal fulfillment um, whatever we determine ethics to be, because they're somewhat fluid and they move. Um, if you're out of one group, it's like anything that doesn't directly do harm to somebody else is okay. And, and that's kind of the, the, the core standard. Um, you can go on to say it's a rational philosophy informed by science. Interestingly, inspired by art, which is a new ad, motivated by compassion, um, and affirms the dignity of each human being. There's a lot of things in humanism 
um, that we would agree with that have been, you know, kind of things borrowed back and forth. Um, it's a democratic and ethical life stance that affirms human beings have the right and responsibility to give meaning and shape to their own lives and goes on to uh, remove God from, from that equation. So, you know, this is definitely a lot of where we are culturally and as a society today. Um, and, you know, you're going to get a lot of context and particularly discussions of love that will center around that. What we're brought back to, and uh, we've referenced John in several contexts as we've gone through this, but if anybody noticed, I had one person ask me um, why I hadn't put any scriptures up from 1st, 2nd, or 3rd John yet. And it's because I was kind of holding those until we got to the back end of this. Um, frequently we call those, you know, John spends a lot of time both in the book of John and 1st, 2nd, 3rd John talking about love. Um, talking about the love of God, talking about, you know, kind of the characteristic and the nature of God and Jesus from the beginning. Um, and you can read and really should read, go back and reread re um, 1st, 2nd, 3rd John. I just pulled uh, a few verses out of those chapters and I would encourage you to go back and kind of reread them and think about this, you know, in the context we just, we just uh, talked through. If you pull 15 and 17 out of 1 John 2, and again, you're missing a lot of kind of setup. Do not love the world or anything in the world. If anyone loves the world, love for the Father is not in them. For everything in the world, the lust of the flesh, the lust of the eyes, the pride of life comes not from the Father, but from the world. The world and its desires pass away, but whoever does the will of God lives forever. So if you follow the path of uh, where humanism is taking you. It is, in fact, based on because there is no afterlife, there is nothing else, there is no higher power, there is no God, that it is all about what's in the world. Now, originally, if you go back to 1930, there was no kind of call out about um, uh, a more hedonistic lifestyle. Um, in the 1990s and the 2000 kind of discussions, there's actually now been worked in, well, we don't mean you should be a hedonist. We don't mean you should be all about your own pleasure, but there actually is kind of this greater calling of the greater good. But that's what 1 John 2 is addressing. If you go down to 1 John 3, it said, and this is his command, to believe in the name of his son, Jesus Christ, and to love one another as he commanded us. The one who keeps his commands lives in him and he in them. And this is how we know that he lives in us. We know it by the spirit that he gives us. And again, if you read the rest of John 3, it's again this calling that it's not just a, oh, you know, being loving would be a nice thing to do. Um, we've hit it several times as we've gone through this series. It's a commandment. It's a commandment not in the same way that um, you might think about the generic way we, are, we use the word love, but it's really a commandment in the sense of something we have to work to, something that we build towards, go back to Second Peter. As we continue to grow and develop as a Christian, that becomes more and more a core part of who we are and how we respond to each other. That's what we're called to. First John 4. Dear friends, let us love one another, for love comes from God. Everyone who loves has been born of God and knows God. Whoever does not love does not know God, because God is love. This is how God showed his love among us. He sent his one and only Son into the world, that we might live through him. This is love, not that we love God, but that he loved us and sent his Son as an atoning sacrifice for our sins. Dear friends, since God so loved us, we also ought to love one another. No one has ever seen God, but if we love one another, God lives in us and his love is made complete in us. This is how we know that we live in him and he in us. He has given us his spirit. So if you read through 1st, 2nd, 3rd John, um, and I'm going to hit the next slide and pick up 2nd John and then go back to a couple of other things, but this whole sense of um, how we are to respond to God being commanded to love, loving one another. You know, as we, when we talked about the Sermon on the Mount, 
That sense of agape love is woven through um, everything that Jesus said. And then when he comes back and, and, you know, begins to close that out, that that is part of uh, the sense of how we are to respond to each other and what's to be the core of who we are. Second John 1, grace and mercy and peace from God the Father, from Jesus Christ the Father's Son, will be with us in truth and love. It has given me great joy, and joy is an interesting word that actually um, turns up in some of the humanist literature and writing as well, and one of the reasons it's in there is because religion has taken joy, so much joy out of the world. So it's an interesting twist if you think about it, and there's some rationale for why that's there, but that actually um, is woven in in terms of having a more joyful life without the burden of religion. So that's an interesting kind of twist to think about as well as you kind of you know, work through this. It's given me great joy to find some of your children walking in the truth just as the Father commanded us. And now, dear lady, I'm not writing you a new command, but one that we have had from the beginning. I ask that we love one another, and this is love, that we walk in obedience to his commands. Have you heard, as you have heard from the beginning, his command is that you walk in love. And then we have read, obviously, John 14 more than once. A new command I give you, love one another, as I have loved you, so you must love one another. By this, everyone will know that you are my disciples if you love one another. So it's woven through the entire kind of fabric and the message about what it is, um, what it is to be a Christian, um, how we are to build that sense of agape love. Brotherly love, yes, and learning how to do that and beginning to kind of respond there um, all the way through spending the rest of our life, if you will, becoming a more loving person. And it's not about any one of the components below that. They're all things that we're on, we can work on, and we're going to kind of come back to that in a minute as well, um, including, you know, one of those that, things that's built into the middle of that that we have trouble with is forgiveness, forbearance. And one of the interesting things that can get in our way is, and it's come up, actually it's come up in our small group, Ron, it's forgiving ourselves. Being able to forgive ourselves and not carrying that burden of, you know, basically not being able to forgive ourselves, which then gets in our way of actually being able to love not only ourselves, but others as well, because we've got that barrier there. We get into a long discussion about people, you know, who grow up in very different circumstances and how do you actually learn love. We are going to talk a little bit about that next week as we kind of wrap all this up. But again, uh, Coming back down to Matthew 5. You've heard that it was said, love your neighbor and hate your enemy, but I tell you, love your enemies and pray for those who persecute you, that you may be children of your Father in heaven. And he goes on from there and says, be perfect, therefore, as your heavenly Father is perfect. And the context for being perfect, you know, in that sense is not um, somehow, you know, we're all there. We've become a Christian we have the gift of the Holy Spirit and we're perfect, but rather telios, moving to that end, continuing to kind of move forward and becoming um, more loving and more Christ-like as we go. So our command to love starts with a love that is beyond ourselves. Um, it starts with God's love for us. It starts with God's demonstration of his love for us. It starts with the example that Jesus laid out, presented, taught, et cetera, for us. Um, and it's with and through God. So when we talk about agape, when we talk about um, faith, hope, and love, and the greatest of these is love, this is what we're talking about. It's what we are commanded to by God. Um, it is the thing that lasts beyond kind of everything else. It is not humanism, it's not humanitarianism, which is a more generic term, kind of, or any of the other isms, because when you read, it's interesting, when you read through a lot of the humanist material, in the last kind of 15 years or so, we've also um, worked in a lot of environmentalism and what's called planetarianism, and, you know, so there's a, 
there's a whole kind of interesting, you know, ism twist that has been progressively kind of becoming more and more in the mix. Um, it's not altruism as an outcome of the selfish gene, i.e., you know, protecting um, our gene pool and or the, even the human race. Um, we have a very bad history when it comes to that discussion, uh, which is why the eugenics movement, um, which was heavily supported by the founders of the kind of formal humanist movement back in the 1930s, by the late 30s, nobody wanted to talk about eugenics anymore. Okay, most of you can figure out why that was. Um, there were three nations primarily supporting the eugenics movement. Germany, UK, and the US. Um, funny thing that, you know, the US and UK kind of put that underground and stopped talking about it. But the end of the programs that were started in that time period didn't finally all kind of go away until the 1970s. Okay, and all that was started under a framework and a guise of humanism and science-based improvement of humanity. So it's interesting to kind of step back and think about the implications of that. Um, that commandment to love is we are commanded to be kind. Compassion is a component, but they're part of the expression of love. We start with love as a core attribute of God. Um, that does not mean all of the other characteristics and attributes of God as the men's group is studying on Wednesday night, um, are not there. Love is always kind of positioned, um, go back to the Old Testament, uh, tied to justice. Um, but agape is idealistic. It is intended to be something that, while idealistic, isn't achievable. It is something that is realizable that we move towards. We move and continue to work towards kind of that end state. Um, and being more and more in the image of God. So as we've kind of gone through this, we've tried to kind of back it down, make it, you know, basic, come back up, talk about more of the context around that, and the fact that it's not, it's not an easy thing. In fact, it may be the single hardest goal we have as Christians, which is why I think um, 1 Corinthians 13 ends the way it does. So this is... Um, this is what we put up last week, and we, we broke down um, the words that were used to characterize. So above the line were all of the phrase that were used, phrases that were used in 1 Corinthians 13. <clears throat> the characteristics of, of love. Um, and below the line are other um, characteristics, synonyms, components, you know, thing, you know words that are used. Um, kind of around that to actually pick up some of the other uh, aspects or components of love. None of those is love, but they're all demonstrations of love, if you want to put it that way. They're all things that we can, that we can you know, work on. So as we think about, um, and last week, um, uh, with, uh, with the lesson last week, um, I just went blank, Ke uh, Kevin Cathy. Um, he talked about preparation, being ready, getting your exercise in. Um, you know, he went to uh, Second Timothy and talked about being, you know, the process, if you will, of being prepared. Um, that's exactly what's involved in this. It's no record of wrongs, which is forbearance or forgiveness. How good are we at doing that? Can we forgive ourselves? Are we actually forgiving others? Are we, still, are we still hanging on to things that happened 15 years ago? Are we hanging on to things that happened five years ago with somebody sitting next to you uh, in the auditorium or across the way on Sunday morning? If we are, we have a problem, right? And we talked about patience. Actually, I think patience came up in our Friday night group too, didn't it, Ron? Um, that is a... Uh, that is a struggle when you start to break this down and you start to ask yourself, what are the things that, you know, I actually have more trouble with? And then what do I do? What are some common, you know, um, what, some common things I can do to help to work on those elements? Because it's all about kind of, again, building um, towards a broader kind of characterization of love in our lives. Um, it's taking on, 
more of those characteristics. And these are components that can help us, you know, to work through that. Uh, we had, um, uh, I had a couple people after last week when this went up said, well, you know, um, I'm good on the patient side. I'm not so much good on the not easily angered because um, I had made a comment about that. Um, not rude, not arrogant. Um, persevering, we have trust, we have hope, you know, all back in there. So as we kind of go, I wanted to pull this back up and say, you know, love doesn't just happen. It actually takes attention, intent, work, and perseverance, and it's part of the journey. So what we're going to do next week, um, after running over a few weeks or a few minutes last week, I was going to try to make sure I wrapped uh, on time today. Um, particularly because I have to go in the back and make sure I'm at the meeting because uh, Rusty, the Skipworth family is all down sick today, not with COVID, but they managed to pick up a summer cold and spread it around to everybody. So they're kind of doing the right thing and hanging out and staying away from everybody today. Uh, so that uh, added some other things we have to take care of this morning. Um, Think about and kind of go back to this, and then what we're going to do next week is really kind of come back, wrap all this up. You know, talk about a couple of uh, kind of hard topics around um, if we were not really raised or taught love or love learned love learned love in a um, challenging way. Um, what does what does that mean? What are the implications of that? Because we all grew up in different circumstances, um, and sometimes we can take for granted that uh, maybe we grew up in a loving household and maybe we didn't. Um, and what, how do you deal with that? Um, and what does that mean for us as, uh, as Christians dealing with each other? And thank you for being here one more week. And then hopefully we're going to uh, we're going to keep doing this for a while, but we're going to, I think, try some other things in terms of maybe a mic in the middle so that we can actually um, do a little bit more of a class-type format and uh, hear questions and kind of responses as well. So we'll see, uh, we'll see if we can keep pushing, kind of given that uh, we've got to stay where we are for a while. Appreciate it.